Okay, well, welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us uh, in these very unusual times. But uh, as I just said to David, uh, you know, it's one of the silver linings of, of this uh, terrible pandemic is that we can actually do this online and we are, we're developing new skills to connect to each other uh, online. And, uh, you know, in, in, in this way, we can be much more inclusive and, and giving everyone a chance to, to, to listen to research that is currently going on. So great to see you all. My name is Stefan Bohm. I'm based at the University of Exeter Business School um, in, in, based on Cornwall in the UK. Um, uh, I'm very, very pleased to be able to uh, welcome uh, Professor David Levy, uh, who's working in the Department of Management at the University of Massachusetts uh, in Boston in the US. Um, I've been following David's research uh, for, for many, many years now. And I remember when I was doing a PhD, I was very intrigued to read his work on on hegemony and neo-Gramscian uh, theory, which, which uh, I think it's fair to say, David, that you made your name with that. Um, um, but more recently, David's work has more and more uh, tried to tackle the, the grand challenges of society and, and economy and the environment. And climate change is, of course, one of the big challenges that we are dealing with. Uh, which, which uh, some people have described as obviously being much, much bigger than, than COVID-19. And COVID-19 is perhaps, uh, you know, a little dress rehearsal for the much bigger challenge that we are still, uh, you know, uh, which we are still facing the brunt of or will face the brunt of in, in the coming years and decades. So uh, David's research is very much focused on that. And I'm, I'm, I'm really glad to say that He's one of the few uh, researchers and professors around the world who, uh, who has consistently um, over the last decade or so worked on issues around climate change, which, which I can't say, unfortunately, for, 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 for many uh, other colleagues in the field of organization and management studies. Um, so David's research on climate change is really at the forefront of, of, of the field. Um, and it's perhaps not surprising that he, he practices what he preaches. He's, he's the co-director of the Sustainable Solutions Lab at, at his home university. And he's also the founder and director of the Center for Sustainable Enterprise and Regional Competitiveness. So I believe that what we are presenting today on, on climate adaptation, David, probably comes out of that research uh, very much on your home turf and I think that's very much um, the way forward that we academics don't just uh, uh, you know we, we're not just pub sitting in offices and publishing in, in the big journals or otherwise but we're actually putting our expertise to use in our localities where we where we live and and do our work and I, I, I think that's what you're doing David so thank you ever so much for uh, uh, giving us this seminar so I will shut up now and hand over to you David over to you okay thank you very much and thanks for inviting me Stefan and for all the other people who've been helping with this presentation um, it does make it easier to get to Cornwall this way it's by, via zoom but I know it, it also has its limitations so I hope everybody is safe and healthy and your families it's a it is a tough time um, but yeah, I appreciate this opportunity. I'm at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, and what I'll be talking about today is some research that is I was conducting in co collaboration with my PhD student who recently graduated, uh, Dr. Nicole Wisman Weber, and so she now is now at the University of San Diego, and uh, Daniel Nyberg, who is at the University of Newcastle in uh, Australia, has been helping develop this piece of it around around sort of the calculation and uh, the models that we'll be talking about today so and you did ask Stefan that we'll talk that I should talk a little bit about the methodology so you know one thing that I can say up front is that we had some funded research to develop some reports for the city of Boston uh, around their climate ready Boston project 
And the way we work is to, so Nicole would sit on a, a lot of these meetings and that would be her data as well for her thesis. So we would be both developing a report for the city as well as uh, collecting data and doing a somewhat more critical version perhaps. So um, if anybody from the city of Boston is attending, you know, they might be surprised. Oh, you know, <laughs> this, is, this is what you thought about us. Um, so, but I did want to start with a side story that's not about Boston. It's about catastrophe bonds. And for those who don't know what catastrophe bonds are, these are bonds that investors who are chasing high returns would like because they pay a little bit higher interest than normal, a bit like a junk bond. But the risk is that if a defined event happens, something like a hurricane or an earthquake, that the investor can lose a chunk or all of their investment. And this was seen as a wizard wheeze way to address some of the financial concerns of the insurance companies who were having trouble setting high enough insurance rates that the premium. So instead, they would sell these bonds to uh, greedy investors who'd be looking for some return and hoping that, they, that the event would never actually happen. Um, and just a couple of minutes to tell you, the, the idea here as well is that these bonds would be based on a defined objective measure of the hurricane or the earthquake and would pay out simply and quickly without all the administrative costs of going around and actually checking the damage so that Mexico, if a defined event happened, would collect, say, for a particular event, $100 million. Um, in September 2014, middle of hurricane season, a Category 4 storm did hit Cabo San Lucas in Mexico, right at the tip of the Baja California uh, Peninsula here in, uh, on the west coast of Mexico, um, causing more than a billion dollars in damage. And Mexico had prepared for this. They had been sold this multi-catastrophe bond to cover both earthquakes and hurricanes. Um, and of course, lots of people got a slice of the value stream here. The World Bank, Swiss Re, Goldman Sachs, you know, all the, all the advisors taking their share in consulting fees. Um, a local company, AIR Worldwide, that models catastrophes and their probability that this one is in Boston. There's a, actually a London-based competitor. There's only really two companies in the world that do this, uh, which is RMS, Risk Management Systems in London. But they do the modeling and they do the pricing of the bond. And you'll see why that is important. Um, Baja California had a hundred million chunk of it. So they could potentially get paid out a hundred million on the contingency that the barometric pressure, which is a proxy for the strength of a, of a storm, would be less than 920 millibars. They would, that would be 100% loss. The investors lose all their money and this region would get $100 million. Um, if it was between these two, uh, between 920 and 932 millibars, it would be a 50% loss. And above 932 millibars, they wouldn't lose anything. And you can see in this lower picture, the track of the storm, it hit dead center into the this town, which is a big resort, a big tourist resort town, so quite important for the local economy. Um, the US National Hurricane Center is responsible for measuring the barometric pressure. But interestingly, rather than being some pure objective thing, they use a whole bunch of different ways of collecting the data, all of which have their own quirks from aircraft, satellites, ships, uh, parachuted instruments like this little picture here where planes fly over a hurricane and drop these things through and they measure it. But the pressure changes at different altitudes and, and quite a bit even within a mile or two of, of the center of a storm, as well as on-ground instruments. But these on-ground instruments can actually get destroyed by the storm. So you, you'd think that there is a simple measure, but there actually isn't. And, um, and then this data gets interpreted by AIR, the same people who priced the bond on behalf of the insurance companies, the issuers, and that determines the payout. So you can see a potential conflict of interest there that the people pricing the bond for the insurers are the same people deciding whether it would pay out or not. And somebody is saying here that he, from, from NHC, he's uncomfortable knowing what the limitations are of our objective ability to measure the strength of the storm using barometric pressure. Um, in this particular case, the initial 
National Hurricane Center reading was 930 millibars, indicating a 50% payout, $50 million. But a couple of months later, there was a final determination that at landfall, this storm had a higher pressure and that they wouldn't pay anything out. And the interesting thing here is that a key reading came from this guy, Josh Morgerman, an amateur storm chaser who measured 943 millibars from his own instrument in his hotel room a couple of miles away in a Holiday Inn, a hotel that was actually destroyed in that storm. Um, and the storm also knocked out a whole bunch of official instruments. They didn't have much to go on, which is why they had to rely on this Josh Morgerman and it ended up um, not paying anything out. It turns out that very few of these cat bonds ever pay out. They find their way to uh, uh, wiggling out of these, okay? Um, so far from being some clear objective process, it can take over three months. And in places like Mexico, the National Hurricane Center, being a US organization, usually has well over a hundred measurements for any particular storm in the US, but only five pressure readings for the average storm hitting Mexico. And they have to do various kinds of interpolations and averages and or extrapolations, right? Because you need to know what the pressure is when the storm hits the, one of these lines in the red box, which is the legally defined area that where the bond is going to pay out. And because you don't necessarily have a measurement there, we have to make various kinds of extrapolations. A bigger issue is that the damage from a storm isn't, doesn't just depend on the barometric pressure, it depends on the size of the storm. Is this a very small, narrow one, or is it a very big, wide one? What's its precise track? Does it go over very um, expensive property or more over land? And how fast is it traveling is a really key thing. If it moves very quickly, it might not do much damage, but if it goes slowly and dumps a lot of rain and the winds hang around for a while, it can do a lot more damage. We talked about those potential conflicts of interest for AIR worldwide. And it wasn't just this one incident. It happens over and over. Hurricane Patricia, the very next year, um, the payout was reduced after they looked at a few other readings a few months later from 100 million down to 50 million. So it turns out it's just, I thought, a good example of ways in which we think objective measures and technical procedures turn out to have potentially some room for bias, for conflicts of interest, and uh, we, we never quite know what the pressure is at a particular point. You'll have to excuse my th throat, that has been a little sore and might be going. Now we get to Boston. Um, so we've been closely involved in this Climate Ready Boston project, and the main problem that what we're, what we're, what, what we're looking at here is that the sea levels are rising. Boston, for those of you who've visited us, um, is a city where nearly half the city is built on fill. It was reclaimed from the harbor and only a couple of feet above sea level. And sea level in various scenarios here is forecast to rise in the high emissions scenario, possibly up towards 10 feet, although the middle, the, the, the middle range is maybe four to five feet by the end of the century. That's in the high emissions. We're probably somewhere in the medium to high emissions scenario is where we're actually at. So maybe somewhere between sort of three feet and four feet is the average uh, expectation. But you can see there's quite a large variation and the city has to plan for that. And I'll be telling you a little bit of a story about why the city decided to plan for three feet, more or less one meter, of sea level rise, even though it's quite likely to be anywhere between two feet and possibly even up to 10 feet. And the most recent science, even since this research was done, is that we're likely to be on the eight foot side to 10 feet rather than the two to three feet. But again, there are a lot of unknowns here. Um, so yes, this, is a, this was a project funded by the Bar Foundation, in, which is a local foundation that has done a lot of climate work for us. They actually have funded our Sustainable Solutions Lab, or SIZZLE, as we like to call it. And so this involved four years of fieldwork. This was Nicole's 
full thesis um, sitting in on lots of different interviews, all the different reports, um, observing the various meetings as well as a lot of archival data. And we really are in the thick of it at UMass Boston. We sit on a little peninsula that was an old rubbish dump. I'm not sure what we meant to take from that metaphor. Um, so we're quite low lying ourselves and the main access road, this is Morrissey Boulevard, um, if anybody remembers with the gas tank, if you've been to Boston, um, just during a high tide, this isn't even a storm. So a few times a year, we get tides that are high enough to shut the main road that leads up to UMass Boston. That's even before you get a four or five foot storm surge from a, from a major storm or hurricane coming up. Um, so this is something that affects us personally. If we have to be kayaking to work, well, I suppose we've all learned to do this by Zoom now, so maybe it doesn't matter anymore. Um, there were two big storms that hit Boston, not even hurricanes, just two winter storms that hit in January and March 2018. Both of these were designated as 100 year storms in the sense that they would expect be expected usually based on historical actuarial data once every hundred years, a 1% probability. So what's the chance? How unlucky were we? You know, that one in 10,000 chance of having two back-to-back 1% -back storms, it's much more likely that these probabilities have shifted because of climate change, but we don't actually know if these are one in 10 year storms, one in five year storms, or were we just very unlucky? You know, all of the insurance, all of the planning, the flood data that, uh, that FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management um, Administration puts out is all based on historical actuarial data. Looking forwards as, the, as we go into the Anthropocene, we're entering a period of risks which are, very difficult to estimate despite all the modeling. And I'll be getting into that a little bit. So the year before 2017, NOAA, you, you know, if you're not American, you don't recognize all these acronyms, perhaps the, uh, um, the national, what is it, the uh, Ocean Oceanographic and uh, Air Administration, something like that. Um, uh, and so they estimated over $300 billion of damage in weather related disasters. The East Coast is certainly waking up to this whole issue post Sandy. The municipalities are waking up. This is the aquarium stop here next to a hotel that was flooded. And you can see the high tech sandbags that were put in to protect the entrance to the subway. If the subway floods, it could cost hundreds of millions because it goes through all the tunnels. We have to shut down the subway system maybe for months and causing huge amounts of damage. That's what happened in some of the tunnels in New York after Hurricane Sandy. So Climate Ready Boston was involved in assessing likely future damages and saying, I got muted as well there, so I need to unmute myself. Um, yeah, so the first phase of Climate Ready Boston was included these various steps, okay? A science-based step, let's see how much sea levels are rising. Second step, a vulnerability assessment. Let's see how much damage, economic damage, everything gets translated into dollars, one of the key, key issues in the whole system here. Let's translate this into dollars and see the risks. They did talk about other risks, heat and health and other issues, but when you look at the report, 90% of it is really about buildings, economic damage, and what should we do to protect the infrastructure and the buildings? And then what should we do? The resilience initiatives and how should we implement? But I'm gonna break that down a little bit more so that you get to see the degree of uh, you know, the degree of uncertainty and how Climate Ready Boston came to grips with it. And I will just give you sort of a, a preview. The punchline at the end is that when we put all the models together, we end up with a fairly arbitrary system. There's so much uncertainty that goes into each one and that when you hook them all up and that the outcome, that planning for 36 inches, turns out to be much more of a politically expedient decision. Let's plan for something that's manageable let's plan for 36 inches because we can manage 36 inches with sea walls and raising some roads and elevating some parks. So let's make this whole problem tractable and manageable and define it that way. And as we'll see, that also keeps the stakeholders at the table and doesn't scare away the developers, the property developers and the other important stakeholders in the city. This is 
downtown Boston with some lines indicating the 100 year flood map put out by FEMA. Um, so these are areas that are mandated to have flood insurance if you have a mortgage, that is, um, again, protecting the financial interests. And you know, FEMA is a good example of some of the conflicting constraints as we as as these various maps are developed right insurance companies are using these old flood maps because that's what they have and that's because what insurance companies have always done there's a sense in which we're leaning on institutionalized practices of the way things have always been done as well as legal constraints that are built into contracts built into the way that FEMA has been set up, FEMA has been mandated by Congress not to look forwards. It's not allowed to take into account future climate change in setting these, these kinds of flood maps. There are also professional norms in, involved in the way that actuarial act, actuaries set these things in the way that people who do cost benefit analysis handle uncertainty and so on. So I'll be talking about these, these various things as well as the way that this 36 inches of sea level rise became black boxed. Once that is an output from one piece of the system, that becomes the unquestioned input into everything else. Okay, and so we call this a risk regime, building on other types of regimes, socio-technical regimes. We call it a risk regime and with the understanding that it's not just a technical system for man managing and estimating risk, it's a social and political system. But in this paper that is based on a paper that, that's uh, based on a draft that's under review currently, um, we do emphasize some of the more technical aspects of it as well. In some other papers we've been looking at equity issues and, and the politics. Um, so we're leaning, I won't have time to go into all, all the theory here and maybe it will interest people a little less, but building on STS and ideas of risk society from Beck and the way that you know modernity claims to have tamed some of the old risks. When we wrote this, it was pre-COVID, so we said disease has been tamed, but obviously that was wrong as well, um, but creates new risks, nuclear and environmental risks and so on, um, and how these are a function of complex technology, both in producing the risks, but also in managing and estimating the risks. And as I said before, it, we're entering this Anthropocene era where we find it much harder to estimate the risks and we've got old institutions, old professional norms, old ways of being to manage the future risks that are still in many ways unknown. So we're figuring, and these risk, risk regimes, they construct the risk for us, both as citizens, for the politicians, they, they construct the risks and give us ways of actually managing it. And they're performative because they're telling the city what to do. We're actually building seawalls, we're investing money, and changing the city and changing the risk profile of different neighborhoods based on the outputs from these systems, these risk management systems. So what we're doing, this is a, you know, just the rear view mirror, we're managing, it's like trying to drive by looking in the rear view mirror, rear view mirror which as many of you know, isn't, if you try it, you'll probably bang into something, not very easy. Whereas the future risks have Um, measuring that's melting quite rapidly, much more rapidly, but we don't actually know quite how fast it's very complex physics goes into figuring this out. So looking forwards, how fast sea level rise will be is uh, one of the big unknowns here. Okay, um, so the first stage of this process was getting a whole bunch of science, scientists together to try and come up with some consensus on how fast is sea level rising. We know the history, We've had about a foot of sea level rise in uh, in the last hundred years or so, and it's going up about three millimeters a year. Sorry to confuse the uh, metric with with um, imperial measurements, um, but what we don't know is in the future we know it's going to get faster exponentially, but we don't know how much faster. Um, that's one just one little piece of this, um, which feeds into these sea level rise projections with a large range of uncertainty um, over time. Um, just to see what that actually looks like in Boston, um, you know, they produced all these maps of areas that are going to flood under one, 
in a one percent storm or a uh, one in ten year storm and even just with with tidal flooding for those of you who've ever landed in boston the airport here is in east boston a very low-lying area of the city and it's also the area where the central tunnels for the main motorways the freeways go through there as well as the underground the t the metro um, so if all of that floods the city is cut off the roads are cut off the airports cut off and the main train lines are all cut off so this is quite serious um, and just pulling out a little bit but the downtown area just by the 2070s here here we actually have the uh you know the rubric of of the different storms you can see large chunks of downtown get flooded here um and umass boston is just just down here a little bit this is the year 2100 plus a five foot storm surge right so we get five foot just a median you know that's not the 10 foot i was talking about before just five feet of sea level rise and five foot storm surge from a big storm um, we've had three and four foot storm surges quite regularly hurricane sandy in new york was about an eight foot storm surge and you can see that most of boston is submerged in this picture um, but of course we have to translate this into financial loss and this is the cost benefit analysis piece of this um, and so one of the headline numbers that came out of this was that with the 36 inches of sea level rise there would be annualized losses in boston average losses that is per year of about one and a half billion dollars so about 80 billion dollars worth of property is exposed to would be exposed to flooding and there might be a decade with no flooding and then a big storm, but this is the average would be about one and a half billion dollars a year under 36 inches of sea level rise. And you can see they broke this down, damage to structures, the building contents, um, a small amount for business interruption and so on. But when we look closely at this, we saw that there were a number of assumptions that led this to be a gross underestimate of the actual likely losses. Well, maybe the most glaring thing is that they, because we don't know how much new building there's likely to be in Boston by 2100, and we don't know how much property prices are going to increase, the professional norm in these kinds of forecasts is if you don't have a, a citable source or an accurate, accurate way of measuring, you assume it's zero. So there's an assumption here of no new building and no price increases in property. Well, anyone who's been in the Boston area for 10 or 20 years like myself knows that property prices have doubled and then doubled again, and there's been a lot of new building. So this vastly estimates the amount of loss. Um, on the other hand, it's an actual dollars. They haven't used a discount rate here. So essentially a discount rate of zero, which um, works the other way. It also doesn't include the systemic impact on a city of losing power, transportation, communications. If the city essentially has to shut down and workers can't get to work, you know, we've seen this with COVID. It's not just individual businesses, but whole what happens when you shut down a city, the losses are far greater than assessing it business by business. These losses are based on insurance loss maps. So insurance companies have maps of the city with different buildings and they figure out if there's a one foot flood then maybe buildings lose 10 percent of their value if there's a two foot flood maybe they lose 30 percent of their value and so we take those building by building losses and then those get aggregated into a city-wide loss but hopefully you can understand that a systemic event like a major flood um, shuts down everything sometimes for weeks and in the and for New York City some of those buildings as well as the train system was shut down for many months okay um, other people have taken this and then looked at what the municipal impact will be the impact on municipal budgets in the coastal cities around Boston here's Boston in the center but there's a lot of cities smaller cities and towns all around that who could lose property and because they lose property they lose tax income which and tax income on property is the primary form of revenue for municipalities in the us um which is a reason why they don't want to contemplate retreat 
retreat is a very controversial approach to sea level rise where we decide to abandon certain areas of each city and say sorry you can't live here we're not going to let you but cities are very loath to do that because of the tax losses involved but you can see how how so much of the research is being driven by the potential losses to investors property owners municipalities this is this is what people are worried about and how, how it gets framed. And this translational process is um, you know, kind of interesting and problematic as well. One of the projects we were involved in that also relied on cost benefit analysis was to evaluate a harbor wall. I was on the periphery of this project. So Boston has all these harbor islands and somebody came up with another wizard wee's idea. Why don't we build a wall just like that wall that the great president Trump wants to build in Mexico or on the on the border to exclude immigrants. Build that wall, that'll solve the problem. So we build a wall and this estimate is currently about $15 billion to build a something like a four or five mile wall, but you'd also have to elevate it in the low lying surrounding areas. So it's about six or seven miles altogether um, to keep out storm surge and with a, some giant gates that would open and close to allow ships in and out. And they would, it would use some of the existing harbor islands, but joining up here. Um, we recommended against this, partly this might not work, right? Partly because as sea levels rise, these gates would be opening and closing much more frequently. Um, and they, they're not just not designed for that. They can take uh, maybe 12 hours for these giant gates to, to move open and close and they can jam and then the city is exposed. Um, we also tended to think that this is premature. If we don't know if sea level rise is going to be two feet or 10 feet, we don't know if this is, uh, you know, what's the appropriate way to build this. Should we commit the 15 billion, which could well be 30 billion by the time these things actually get built. Um, and the money would be better spent, and here was our political agenda coming in, that money would be better spent on shoreline protection, and that money could also go into projects that would encourage economic development in the poorer communities. There's a lot of minority immigrants and poorer communities around South Boston, East Boston, Dorchester, some of these coastal areas where UMass Boston, this is, U, this is our university on this little peninsula here. Um, and by putting the money into roads and strengthening housing and local projects, the idea was to drive economic development. And, and But anyway, a lot of that isn't happening either. So uh, just to compare to the Thames barrier with which some of you might be more familiar, this is, the Thames here is about 600 meters wide, you know, only maybe a third of a mile compared to this sort of six mile gigantic project. But it's very appealing, the idea of a technical fix, the commercial property community was behind this because they thought somebody else will pay, here's a technical fix and we can carry on business as usual. As we'll see, one of the key themes that we keep bumping into is the effort to reconcile on the city's behalf. How do we uh, recognize and address climate change, but keep up business as usual? How do we keep developing how do we let new buildings go up so the city can increase its tax base, tax base, keep the developers happy, keep the banks happy. Let's try and do something about resilience, but within that business as usual frame. And maybe we're trying to reconcile the irreconcilable, but that's come, that kind of explains this effort to portray the whole climate change is issue as something which is manageable and doable without radical change to our lives, our budgets, resource allocation, and so on. I think we're seeing a very similar thing going on with COVID, whether just in the last few days in Liverpool and Manchester, right? You know, we're trying to, those tensions between life as usual and recognizing that, that we're in a, both a climate and a, a health emergency. Okay, so this, this is sort of the heart of the models and experts piece, um, and David, so, about five minutes, is that all right? Oh, a little bit more. I'm looking at my clock. I'm saying, okay, 10.37. A um, little bit, okay, if I'm going to slightly over, I was hope, hoping to go to 10 because we started a couple of minutes after. But okay, let's, uh, so the heart of this 
are these different models here, global climate models, global circulation models that forecast up to 2100 how much things are going to warm up, as well as other models that say how much is the sea level going to rise, models of how much Greenland is melting and the hydrodynamics. Then we have those models I talked about, about insurance losses, forecasting which areas are going to flood and how much is that going to cost. And then other models that are e economists doing cost benefit analysis, trying to value buildings and life and deciding where we actually build things. And you know, one of the main claims of this paper, and we use assemblage theory, which I'm not going to go into too much, is that is that the the, when you assemble these technical models together, all with their own assumptions, all with their own uncertainty, by the time you go from one to the next to the next, the output from one becomes the input to the next, that the, the decisions at the end of the day are somewhat arbitrary. They're not, you know, we claim that they're scientific and objective, but there's such large uncertainty. And this is all being shaped by academics and consultants, as well as the people in the city, that there's room for, uh, it's, it's shaped by um, politics as well, as, as well as by the interests of the people at the table, who are primarily the city interested in its tax revenue, consultants and the community groups who are affected tend to be excluded in this highly technical process. Okay, so we call this a risk regime. Here's another little pretty picture of the risk regime. A risk regime, and this harks back to the, to a little bit to Gramsci and hegemony for those of you who know me, right? Three pieces to the regime, the economic technological piece that I've been talking about, the governance political piece, and a normative discursive piece. And within this risk regime, risk is constructed, managed, and distributed with just for example, the decisions to build, to protect certain areas of the city, those, this cost benefit analysis, it always tends to show that the rich areas of the city, the rich commercial and residential areas are worth protecting because they generate a lot of revenue and the houses are worth a lot of money. So the value of protecting those areas is high. The value of protecting the poorer areas is much less in a, if you just want to use a straight objective cost benefit analysis. I'm going to skip over this. This sort of came from my first, uh, the first paper that Nicole and I did that was actually published in organization um, about a year and a half ago. But it, it's about the imaginaries, the discursive ideas that go into these regimes and the the struggles between the different groups, the groups who want business as usual and to keep on building. The folks who want to use cat bonds, catastrophe bonds, the innovative models and finance, we can solve all this if we just have the right models, kind of this faith in science and markets and so on, versus the folks who want radical change. And we make the case that the city is actually adopting what we call a progressive instrumentalist approach, which is primarily business as usual, but trying to adapt, use some of these new models and finance, trying to muddle their way through, making that compromise to the, and trying to reconcile climate change and, oh, I'm stuck in a little loop here. Um, just in, in the last few minutes, um, talked about most of this, but this is, this is a great little quote from one of the consultants on the project who's, who was saying, if you want to include equity, he was saying, that's fine. We can put it in there. Just come up with some numbers that we can plug in. You know, give us some numbers that we can add on to our cost benefit analysis. Of course, we don't have some easily available numbers that are not contested that you can plug in. But he says, make sure it's monetized. Not just that you have a number, but that it's a, a dollar number. And if you want it to be included in an adaptation, if you don't monetize, it won't be included. And that sort of says everything there. Um, another quote about how risk is tamed. So this, this person, it was hard to get people to actually say it, but here we go. 36 inches is not a worst case scenario, but there's a greater than roughly, it, it is roughly a 50% likelihood that it'll be more than 36 inches. But we came out not knowing if we're going to be getting blowback from the development community. Everyone is sort of fine with those numbers. And so this is a city manager saying they chose 40 inches out of all the possible scenarios through all of you know deciding what they're going to plan for what they're going to build for and this is now is going into zoning that all new buildings have to uh, actually have 40 assume 40 inches of uh, flood of sea level rise um because that keeps the developers at the table it 
they don't want to seem crazy they don't want to seem extreme um but you can see out of all of this out of all of this science and out of all of this process it's a somewhat arbitrary number and it was a number that was chosen to be sort of middle of the road manageable tractable and keeping people at the table um another little wrinkle to this is a similarly so we we had some people visiting the city trying to sell us catastrophe bonds but also at the same time Standard and Poor's, Moody's, the people who are rating bonds for the city, and the city issues a lot of bonds, we have a very strong bond rating, a very low interest rate, were saying the, these bond rating agencies are saying that they're going to start including climate change as a risk factor. And if cities don't prepare for climate change, then their interest rate and their risk could go up. But this consultant was saying, look, if you start modeling risk at the city level, then Standard and Poor's is going to take notice and if you're not doing enough then just by raising the issue then that might hurt our the city of boston's bond issuing ability so there is another sort of conflict of interest there right if the city starts investigating and finding out how exposed we are to climate risk the bond rating agencies can come along and say oh well we're not going to we're not going to uh, rate your bonds as highly anymore it's going to be hard to issue new bonds at the low cost that we have been doing in the past so you know the governance is by these financial models as well okay well i am at the end here anyway so it'll be time for questions just wanted to end with this pretty little picture of the the consultants contract with artists to give us and so we have this optimistic view of what the city will like when we adapt to climate adaptation right when we adapt to rising sea levels it's not going to be all gloom and doom of course i'm not sure if that's meant to be a little lifeboat here on the right or actually it's uh you know people enjoying their summer's day in boston but you know so the consultants give this whole spin with the beautiful pictures of the, we can adapt the city we can manage it you'll all be living you'll all be outdoors and happy look nobody's wearing masks well that was because this was done before covid um so, you know, the punchline here is that this assemblage of these calculative devices, and I know I didn't go into all the theory behind that, you know, the algorithms, the instruments, the market devices, the experts and the consultants, this becomes a large system, a complex dynamic system, which can has unintended results, but it's also subject to politics and bending and shaping. And we need to understand the risk regime as this interesting assemblage and I don't I can't claim that we've poked all the corners and figured out exactly how it's working but it's just such an interesting thing to study both getting into the technicalities of the models and the algorithms and how it interacts with the city and the experts and the consultants and also looking at who's left out you know the community groups who don't understand necessarily the language and the and the techniques and so on but this has a very material impact this is deciding what gets built, who gets protected, where the money gets spent, and so on. So it has that hegemonic function of pulling together and saying, we have, we have a solution that addresses climate and keeps everybody happy. So I'm going to leave it there. Hopefully you're happy with that and found it interesting. So thank Great. you. Thanks. Thanks very much, David. We have a clap of hands uh, virtually. Um, thank you so much. Um, we'll go straight into some questions and comments. Um, can I please ask everyone to uh, put their questions and comments in the chat box? Otherwise, we're going to manage. We're not going to manage the uh, you know the numbers of you know with the technology here. So I'll just um, I'll just go with the first question that was posed by uh, Will. Don't know the full name, um, which is a bit of a technical question. How significant do you think insurance's adoption of AI and the Internet of Things, I presume it means, um, might more effectively forecast and cost the risk involved? So it's a bit technical. So essentially, you know, do we have technological tools that actually can forecast the risk better now? And will that become better in the coming years? Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not a complete Luddite when it comes to technology 
And clearly, you know, the newer models for climate forecasting, you know, tend to be a little bit better than the old models. But we do hit these walls. I'm less familiar with AI, but on the climate modeling front, you know, as the spatial and temporal resolution gets higher, and we're using faster and faster supercomputers, um, you can potentially get more accurate models. But at the same time, that the because there are so many more iterations on each one. Um, any small errors at the beginning get magnified. You know, those butterfly effects actually get magnified and you hit a wall where in some ways, the more powerful the models, the finer the models, the more sensitive they are to going wrong the, and the further out in time that you go. AI, you know, can potentially have some similar issues. I'm, I'm less familiar with it as a technique. Um, AI can work well in some things, but as we've seen, you know, AI for facial recognition can be racist. AI. You know, AI picks, if you looked at AI patterns and said, who's insurable, it would tell us that minorities are less insurable because they look at what we've done as humans in the past. Um, and so it can, you know, quite often pick up those patterns without uh, and, and replicate the existing structural inequalities. So AI is, it's, can be fun, um, but I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't completely make, put my faith there to solve all these issues. Okay. Okay, great. Um, reminder, we don't have time to get people into speaking directly. I'm, I'm really sorry. Put your questions in, in the chat, please. Um, going straight to uh, the question by Dermot O'Reilly. Um, David, uh, what advice would you give to researchers critical, critical of local state business regimes, but who wish to impact directly on what they are doing? Badly, I, you know, what can we as researchers do to positively impact yeah. change? Yeah. No, 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 it's it's a great question. And at the Sustainable Solutions Lab, you know, we talk about this. How do we both engage with the city, talk their language, do some critical work, and how do we bridge that? You know, how do we work with communities and encourage them to have joint meetings with the communities? Because what they tend to do is have these community engagement events that are separate. They're a little bit more like window dressing, but they don't come into the core decision making. Um, but you have to work the local politics and try and get them in a room together and find ways. Um, but it means having credibility with the city and uh, or with the local authorities, wherever you are. Um, it's a process of, of gaining credibility with the key actors in the city, with the funders. In our case, it's the, you know, this local foundation has been doing a lot of it. Um, and, you know, we, we, we're doing more projects actually on climate justice as well, to, about uh, trying to integrate different voices. But it's tough. What can I say? Um, but I think you know, these are through universities. You can be those conveners who can try and do it. And to if you have credibility talking to the mainstream, you can also try and do it here. I mean, it, sure. you know, it's, it's okay. be a much longer discussion. You know? Thanks, David. Uh, next question by Varun. Um, how can organizations adopt a more systemic lens to better understand both their contributions and detractions from planetary systems. Yeah. How can organizations ad adopt a more systemic lens? Mm -hmm. do, do, you know, do you know any good tools that allow them to have this kind of systems perspective? Um, I, I, again, I mean, it's a very broad question. All, all I can say is, you know, in the Boston region and probably elsewhere, I, I know certainly in London, I don't know your region, you know, there are lots of networks where there are discussions and presentations like these. And I think it's the outcome of being part of a lot of different, pres you know, I, I did some work earlier, where there was a very interesting difference between Shell and BP that were tied into these external networks of NGOs and scientists and did these kinds of, and participated in these kinds of presentations that you put on Stefan and Exxon that relied on internal filtering and internal or a censorship mechanism and didn't get those larger voices and we're very much locked onto their climate denial pathway. Um, so, you know, I think encouraging organizations to be part of these larger conversations and giving people time and exposure to, you know, debates and presentations and of all different kinds. Okay, great. Uh, question by Matthias Tager. Uh, could you expand how the political is maybe not just limited to selecting the most convenient technical model outputs, but maybe extend to the workings and design of these technological black boxes. 
Yeah. So, yeah. did you understand? Yes, yes. I mean, the politics are in so many areas here, right? It's in the which which communities are most exposed to climate change in the first place, and the fact that the poorer neighbourhoods tend not to have insurance and don't have resources to recover. It's in the decisions, and I mentioned the cost-benefit analysis that leads to some area the richer neighbourhoods being protected in the selection of the consultants and the models and just the whole approach of using those rather than talking to the communities about what their concerns are around climate change. When we when we talked to some of the communities, you know, their concerns were much more immediate. How will we access shops for food if these roads are flooded? How will we get to the health centres? Much more immediate um, concerns rather than the way that the city had mapped it out. Um, so, and you, as you saw in Mexico, in the Mexican case with the catastrophe bonds, these were bonds that were built and designed by investors and Goldman Sachs to serve, to serve investors and they ended up working intentionally or not. There are lots of debates about that to deprive a relatively poor region of the, of, of the bond revenues that they expected. Um, so there are many, many ways that this is that this has these political outcomes, sometimes unintended. That's why we say it's a you know it operates like a complex dynamic system, this risk regime with unintended consequences, but nevertheless that sort of supports the status quo and the more dominant actors. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, next question by Jasper Finkelday. Hello, David. Uh, did you factor in generational justice? Cynically speaking, the politicians will no longer be in office when the flood becomes unsustainable. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, sure, sure. And that gets factored in whether you, in the choice of discount rates when you when they're doing the cost benefit analysis. Generally, they're too high. You know, they can be six, seven percent. They're using um, some arbitrary choice that makes future generations rather worthless. Um, but uh, I mean, you know, not explicitly, you know, we, we were just pointing to some of those limitations of cost benefit analysis that, uh, yes, it tends not to include f future generations. You know, again, you know, there are institutionalized practices, the way that the local consultant firms, and once it was done in New York, they'll use the same method in Boston. Once it's been done in Boston, they'll use the same technique when these consultants go to the next place, because, well, if it was good enough for them, it's good enough for us. And, uh, and yeah, it tends not to include. Of course, there are economists who will be looking at those impacts in some papers here and there, but it's not that's not in the mainstream of the way that cost-benefit analysis gets used for municipal planning. They don't use all the finer tools um, and the marginal papers of what we could potentially do to capture some of these impacts. Okay. Thank you. We're working you hard, David. Next question. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Stephen Allen. Um, Thank you very much, David. Are you drawing specifically on actor network approaches to consider assemblages? Mm -hmm. If so, how have you found it as a perspective, lens or lexicon for developing your analysis? What aspects have been most valuable to you? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm a f quite a fan of, uh, is it Don, Don McKenzie in, in um, Scotland? I think is at U of Edinburgh. Um, you know, the way he uses actor network and, and more, more broadly the calculativity and uh, you know, the social construction of the technology and the political impacts of it. And I'm not a, you know, actor network is okay. Um, and it comes into assemblages. I suppose I'm using that in a looser way here. You know, I'm not committed to one particular approach. And for the next, the next revision of, of this paper, they do want us to be more disciplined in our theoretical approach. Um, because there are various versions of assemblage theory as well. Um, you know, for myself, I, I'm a little bit more interested in the complex dynamic system and the technical ways in which, in, in which the different parameters and assumptions and uncertainties are handled in these models and the way that these models interact in various ways and then how they're used by these consultants. You know, which particular theory we hang that on, to, to be honest for me, is, is a little less interesting. Um, you know, I, I like to see where the insights about how these, the use of these models goes. And then, you know, I think we can make remarks about assemblage theory. Some of these theories, you know, are, are just a little too abstract and seeing how it actually plays out in a city planning context is just fascinating. 
and tells you a lot more than you might read in a theoretical paper about. That's my own view. Um, sure uh, but, but if I if I may have a sort of a personal uh, follow up to that. So sure. is is there? Um, um, I mean, how do you handle? You know, you talk. You know, you use a lot of new Gramscian sort of regime theory, which you mentioned here as well. Uh, so how you know how do you match that with the more social technical system kind of uh, yeah. assemblage approaches. I mean, is there a particular reason why you keep going back to uh, Neo Gramscian theory or, or you know, what, what, what is Neo Gramscian regime yeah. theory doing that others are not doing? Yeah, okay. I mean, j just within the Actor Network theory, yes, I mean, there is a certain agency to this to the technical system as well, right? You know, they, they, they behave in particular ways that at some point becomes almost independent of, of the actors, the human actors there, or at least they interact with them. But yes, the, um, you know, it is a hegemonic system in the way that this, the, the, and that's why I go back to Gramsci, because we see this risk regime as having this technical economic, the political governance piece, as well as the, um, sort of the discursive, the constructive, how we think about risk, the, uh, you know, the narratives about risk, you know, those elements are there and the city is struggling to forge some kind of consensus among the dominant actors as a path forward. So they need to spend a few billion dollars, they need to raise the money, keep the bonds of holders happy, keep the developers happy, most of the residents, and they tend to marginalize the poorer communities, both as, both in terms of who they're going to protect and in terms, and, and as a voice at the table. So there is this larger political dynamic that plays out almost unwittingly, even as the city, I think in very good faith, is trying to address this problem and keep various stakeholders happy and plan away. You know, we, we've got a very progressive city here in Boston um, trying to deal with this. Uh, so, but even in good faith, the way that the models and the experts and the way it all comes together tends to perpetuate the status quo and you know, maybe maybe there'll be some big storm that'll shake things up. But for now, you know, we can pretend that the, system, that the problem is manageable and being managed by the people in charge. And so I think that you know the way that hegemony shifts and adjusts, but more or less protects the current status quo, including the power of the main actors, um, you know, the finance, the city, the predominant actors in the city. Um, is is why I, we haven't put it explicitly into this paper, but that's behind the scenes in my mind, if you like. Right. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Okay. Great. Well, our hours up. I'm afraid. Um, you know, it's it's it. You know, it's amazing how quickly an hour goes. But uh, I'm 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 sure you you need to break now, uh, uh, David. And um, so we'll give you that break. And uh, thank you again for this very insightful talk. I'm sure it's something we'll keep talking about for the uh, many years to come uh, as, as, as climate adaptation will rise up the agenda, probably. So thank you again. There are all sorts of thank yous being expressed on the chat. Uh, I'll save the chat for you later. There are a few more questions and comments there, which I'll send to you. Um, so thanks to everyone. Yeah. Thanks to all for attending. And I'll, if you want to follow up personally, I'm not, uh, well, Stefan's got my email, just david.levy at umb, like umassboston.edu. Um, yeah. yeah. So thank right. you. Um, message to my students. Uh, can we have a 10 minute break? And then we'll, we'll reconnect in about 10 minutes, if that's okay uh, with you as well, David. That's great. Thank you. And I'll say goodbye to everyone else uh, and uh, have a good day um, until next time. Have a okay. good day. Have a good weekend. Bye. Shabbat shalom to whoever. Shalom. Shalom.